good sign. It's only inflation. You know, the local inflation. Great, thanks, Rob. Bye. Richard Branson is founder and chairman of the Virgin Group of Companies and Virgin Atlantic Airways. The Virgin Group is one of the world's biggest entertainment conglomerates, consisting of over a hundred different companies in more than 30 countries. The group is centered around Virgin Records, the largest private record company in the world, making Branson the boss of stars like The Simple Minds, Paula Abdul and Phil Collins. Virgin also has its own recording studios and its own retail operation, the renowned Mega Stores. In all, Virgin has about 5,000 employees and an annual turnover of more than $1 billion a year. Branson started his own airline in 1984. Virgin Atlantic Airways is now carrying almost a million passengers a year to eight different destinations. Branson is also known for his record-breaking attempts like doing the fastest boat crossing of the Atlantic and flying the biggest hot air balloon ever built. An extraordinary tycoon, the chairman without a desk, Richard Branson. I think in, in order to understand Richard, properly you have to understand where he's come from and understand his background and he comes from a quintessentially English upper middle class background. His father was initially a barrister, a latterly a stipendiary magistrate, which is a sort of judge. Um, his mother comes from a Scandinavian family originally, which I think is probably where Richard gets his physiognomy from, the, the, the rather Scandinavian looks he has. I was. Uh, very fortunate to come from a secure, very happy background uh, with wonderful parents and, and uh, two sisters. And um, we lived in the country and I uh, always have a, a yearning to recreate the country wherever I am, which maybe is why I work from a houseboat. Um, and, uh, and we were reasonably well off. I mean, they were comfortable, not, not rich, but not poor. And I suppose it had a great security, a, a very secure background. The family background in law, the notion of going on to public school, which under normal circumstances would more or less guarantee you an entrance into Oxford or Cambridge or one of the better universities. Uh, his, his career might have followed a, a fairly preordained and fairly orthodox path, but it was clear if you look back at that, that, that Richard was the, the peg that refused to fit into the hole. When he was about 13 and pupil at a prestigious public school, Branson, an average student at best, had the idea to start a national magazine for students. Such a magazine did not exist and was, as far as Branson was concerned, badly needed. I was quite angry uh, and, uh, and I, had, I had no wish to become an entrepreneur. All I wanted to do was edit a magazine to answer back. Um, and, uh, and it was only when I started trying to see how I could finance it, that I, in a sense, started to become an entrepreneur. I mean, I had to work out of the telephone box selling the advertising space in order to raise some money to launch the magazine. He would uh, phone up somebody in order to sell them advertising, and he was able to uh, you know, lower his voice a few decibels so that he wasn't the squeaky 15-year-old boy with lots of acne on his face, which is what he actually was. You know, so he was, he was very adept at bluffing and, uh, and leading people uh, not in a malicious or not in a malicious sense, but leading leading them to, to to what might not necessarily be the right conclusion about you know the enterprise they were getting involved in and actually lending money to. The first issue of Student Magazine appeared in January 1968 with a printing of 50,000 copies. The editor and publisher was 17. The fact that he'd managed to get his magazine published also resulted in Branson's first television appearance. When you're 15. People don't take you seriously if you say you want to begin a national magazine. But I took myself very seriously indeed and decided to leave school and to do my best to start a national magazine for students.
We had hundreds of people out in the streets selling it. Uh, we had a contacts in every university, all the schools selling it. And they were meant to send, send us back uh, half the cover price. And of course, not much of the money came back. Um, but um, we got a good circulation and the advertisers were sort of happy. The offices of Student were located in a house near Hyde Park that Branson had somehow managed to rent. It became the place to work and live for a growing number of young people who dropped by. Like, for example, the then 18-year-old Chris Stiglianu. Most people, I suppose, were between 15 and 22. A lot of, a lot of people came here straight from school because they'd heard of Student Magazine. Um, people who worked for Richard were paid two pounds a day. Um, and if they were lucky, they collected that every evening. If they weren't lucky, they had to wait because, you know, Richard was always short of money. Um, so the whole building had an appearance of sort of chaos. But in fact, it did work. I mean, there was business being done. It wasn't just all, you know, people hanging out, as they say. In spite of a constant lack of money, Branson also started an advisory centre to give free advice and information to the readers of Student Magazine on subjects like abortion, drugs or homosexuality. We started manning telephone lines and, uh, and we were getting hundreds of calls every week from people who wanted to know, you know who they could go and see if they had a problem. Um, and it's actually still going now. It's, it's now funded by Virgin. And it's obviously the, the, some of the problems are, are, are less than they were then. Um, but most of the problems actually still exist. One thing you've got to remember, of course, is that nobody was meant to be here. This was a house owned by the church commissioners. Um, I don't know who signed the lease originally. I suspect it was probably Richard's mother or Richard's father, but effectively this was meant to be a house with a family living it, not um, a lot of teenagers running a magazine and a help organisation. Amusingly, the person that came to our rescue was the local vicar. Um, and uh, he said, um, you know, I like the work you're doing with the advisory centre. Why don't you come and... Uh, use the crypt of my church um, as your offices. Okay, well here we are. This is the famous crypt. I haven't been back here since 1969. Oh, God, it's still as damp as it always used to be. This is where um, Student Magazine had its distribution. We had magazines stacked up on the left and right in here. Um, give us your headache stickers stacked up. This is where I used to have my desk. Uh, that was my office, really. It doesn't look much like an office, but it was. I had a desk and a typewriter. Now, um, you take one and six for every copy that you sell, and we take one and six. Well, there's no payment in advance or anything like that. All you do is take a certain number, should we say? But it was all day to day. And no one, there wasn't such a thing as a sort of planned, you know, nothing was planned. The, the, the money side of it certainly wasn't planned. Um, Richard was having different ideas every day, crazy ideas about, you know, what we should all be doing, what would happen next. And in fact, the whole Virgin, the whole Virgin record um, idea right at the beginning was another crazy idea of his, um, the mail order. We put in an advert in the magazine, uh, Virgin Records, 10 to 60 percent off any album on any label. Uh, you know, write to us if you want the first ever cheap record. And nobody had ever sold records cheaply before. Uh, and we hadn't got any records, so we put this advert in and uh, had hundreds of replies. Uh, and we then went along to the local record shop and said, look, you know, could you please sell us the records a bit cheaply because uh, we've, we've got to send them out now, um, which they did. Within a month, they were selling four to 5,000 records a week. Although the selling of records was originally started to fund Student Magazine, Branson soon found that he didn't have time for it anymore. The magazine was silently put to rest and the mail order company became the principal activity. And I remember sitting around in the basement trying to think of what we should call a company, whether it should be um, Virgin or, I think, Slip Disc Records was the other favourite. Slip Disc Airlines, I'm quite glad we didn't call it Slip Disc anyway. <laughs> um, but um, unfortunately, we, we, we chose Virgin as, you know, reflecting our inexperience in business. Virgin Records was an instant success. And the idea of selling records through the mail may be born out of inexperience, seemed to be a stroke of genius. But its greatest strength also turned out to be its greatest weakness when the 1971 mail strike nearly finished the young company. It looked like we were going to go out of business. Um, but we one day walked down Oxford Street and uh, we went into a 
a shoe shop where the souvenir shop is and asked to speak to the manager and uh, asked if he had a spare floor, which he said he had, and uh, wandered up and I said to the shoe manager, look, you give us your, uh, your spare floor, you, we'll sell records there. All these people will pour through your shoe shop, you'll sell lots of shoes, and um, we don't want a penny rent, um, but he said fine. So uh, we moved in, uh, we sold lots of records. Um, I don't think he sold any shoes, but lots of shoes walked out from the people who were coming to buy our records. It's quite strange, because that, that shop there was about 200 feet. Uh, we now have a shop around it, which is 50,000 feet. So, you know, we've been buying up all, all the shops around it. The only shop, in fact, that won't sell was the old shoe shop. So it's right bang in the middle of, of, of uh, the, the, little, the, sort of the virgin retail operation. Um, but that, that, that little shop out there was, um, anyway, the beginning of the empire. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we go have a look? Yeah, come and have a look. Yeah. So you had people changing shoes, and then upstairs we had the record shop. So, do you realise where you're sitting? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the anyway. This is the record shop. Uh, it was bare like this, and uh, and it remained bare because we didn't have any money to do it up. So we just put posters all over the wall, posters on the ceiling, pillows on the floor to cover up the fact that it was the dirty carpet. Um, and uh, just knocked up a, a rough counter. Got a couple of friends to come and sell. Um, and we then found that, uh, that we, we, we had great difficulties paying the bills because not only was the shoe shop records were walking, but records were walking up here as well. And uh, so we would open a shop at the beginning of the month in Liverpool um, and uh, we wouldn't have to pay the bills at the end of the month, so we'd have a whole 30 days and just hope that we'd get enough money in that time to pay for the fixing out of this shop. And uh, we'd always get a good rush the first month, so we'd then open another shop and another shop and another shop. And um, within about two years, we had about 30 shops open. The last of these small shops was closed in the 1980s, because although it's still Virgin's policy in most cases that small is beautiful, when it comes to record shops, they tend to think big is better. Consequently, Virgin's mega stores are the biggest and best stocked in the world. How are you? How's it all going? All right. Very, very busy. Yeah. Uh, very good day so far. Great. Uh, if I leave you with these guys, would you mind? Show them around. I'm going to go and have a look at the Virgin Atlantic New York place. Great. Cheers. Come on, let me show you around and uh, show you where everything is. We're in the middle of the uh, vinyl LP section at the moment. Everything's subdivided into the different classifications. We've got soul, roots. Over there, we've got our major rock section. In 1972, Branson expanded the company. He didn't want just to sell records. It seemed only logical to try and start making them as well. So in order to become a record company, it was decided to open Virgin's own recording studio. We then had the idea with Tom Newman um, of, of setting it up in the country. And we stumbled across this lovely old manor house near Oxford. This used to be a car park here, so it was much more untidy then because, you know, everybody with their cars rotting, all the old bangers used to be running there. Oh, you still got the shit? The original idea of a country studio was that there wasn't, you know, all, all the studios were these nasty little things in nasty little cellars in London. Uh, so the idea of having a beautiful place like this um, to come and record, you should, should be able to record better music. At least everybody was in the same place, you weren't going to lose musicians. So. Um, so the, the idea of a country studio was, was a unique one, uh, which was Tom's one, uh, was a, an idea which worked extremely well. A band called Arthur Lewis band came down and the guitar player who was just doing the session was Mike Oldfield. And um, during the course of, of the recording, 
uh, there was numerous breakdowns and during one of the breakdowns <laughs> <laughs> Michael came up and thrust this nasty little spool of tape at me and said listen to this listen to this this is really good and I, I put it in my pocket and listened to it you know kind of a day or two later and it was the most amazing demo of, of kind of pieces of beautiful guitar playing and the awful dreadful Branson claws got into it and that was it I remember um, playing it to anybody and everybody that came to the houseboat. Um, I mean, it just, you know, I think anybody that listened to it knew that it was something extraordinary and special, even me. <laughs> I remember that one. When did I first meet Richard? Uh, it's been somewhere, sometime around 72. I remember I had a job at the manor playing bass with a, a black musician. And, uh, sort of sounded a bit like Jimi Hendrix. I was playing bass with him. And uh, they were still building the manor studio then. It was still just a barn. And uh, I thought he was a very nice man. He had some special special talent, which was obviously later to grow into the whole of Virgin. And um, then it took about a year from that first meeting until I went to the manor to start recording Tubular Bells on my own. The legendary album, Tubular Bells, was the very first release of Virgin Records. It became a million seller, making Mike Oldfield a star and Virgin a small but respected record company. The company expanded in the following years, and apart from record retail and recording, other ventures were started. But it wasn't until 1976, when a new generation of pop stars appeared on the scene, that Virgin really started to grow. As a result of signing the Sex Pistols, we attracted lots of other bands, the Motors, um, the members, um, uh, Phil Collins, um, uh, you know, Al Peter Gabriel, other, a lot of other people. I think we, we'd, we'd established this ourselves as a record company that could promote product, uh, a record company that was good at uh, you know, being in the entertainment business. You could have a steam train I think one of the strengths of, of Virgin is that as a, sort of a group of young people, they've always gone against the rules in a lot of ways and uh, been quite prepared to, to take risks and gambles that other people either haven't had the guts to go for or weren't interested in. Over the years, Virgin signed a wide variety of artists, like, for example, Peter Gabriel, The Human League, XTC, The Simple Minds, Culture Club, Madness, Genesis, UB40, Phil Collins, Scritti Politti, Ziggy Marley, Steve Winwood, Nena Cherry, Soul to Soul, T. Pao, Wendy and Lisa, Paula Abdul, Lenny Kravitz. Over the years, more than 250 virgin artists fueled the company's growth with a steady stream of hits. As a result, the number of employees rose from 70 in 1972 to some 5,000 now. At the same time, turnover increased from $4 million in 1972 to more than $1.5 billion today. Over the last decade, the Virgin Group, as it's now called, has also become active as a book publisher in television 
and as a movie production company, producing or co-producing films like 1984 with John Hurt and Richard Burton. George Orwell's vision became the world's biggest selling futuristic novel. Now, 1984 has been brought to the screen with a cast to match its stature. John Hurt. And Absolute Beginners, starring David Bowie. Nowadays, the Virgin Group is the largest privately owned company in Britain. But it's still run from a houseboat on a London canal, with mostly the same people running it that started it nearly 20 years ago. I mean, the good reason being that they're worried about... Uh, I would certainly like to fight you fight. Fight you fight. Virgin strength like is that the same people that were working for it in the 60s, 70s are still working for it in the 80s, 90s. Um, and that stability of staff means the artists find it stable. Um, and we, the fact that we haven't had a major artist leave us in 20 years, um, I think it's very much due to the fact that they're dealing with the same people year after year. Whereas, you know, our, competi our competitors, the managing directors and people are changing all the time. It's just, you know, the, the, the artists never know who they're dealing with next. Um, so well, I'm proud, I'm, I'm, you know, we're proud of the fact that, that, um, that people choose to stay with Virgin rather than choose to leave Virgin. Particularly in the, in the early days, as the company was growing at a, at a, at a fast rate, uh, situations arose that nobody had ever conceived would arise, you know, positions in the company which had to be held. We need somebody to look after export. Um, this guy who's packing records, right, you're going to look after export for us, but I know nothing about export. Doesn't matter, give it a whirl, bang, and in he goes. The man who now runs the record company, Simon Draper, uh, started off packing records in, in a warehouse in, uh, you know, in West London. Um, Ken Berry came in just as a general gopher, uh, you know, looking after the accounts when there were 12 people there, and he's now you know, effectively kind of Richard's right-hand man in, in, in the company. So there, there, are, there are several people who've, who've stayed loyal and whose loyalty has been repaid uh, in terms of position and in terms of you know, their own personal comfort. You know, there, there are more than three millionaires working for Virgin. Mike, so where are those opportunities? Cause I think to show trust in other people's ability will, generally speaking, pay dividends ten times over. Um, occasionally it'll go wrong. Um, but out of 150 companies we've set up over the years, you know, we've only ever had to close down, you know, one or two of them. And all those companies, what we've said to people is, you know, you go, you go ahead and uh, run this company as if it's your own company, um, and we'll interfere as little as possible. And, you know, they can, they can make of it what they want. And, uh, and you know, because there, there, because there isn't that frustration of a, a formal board where they have to go back and wait for six months for decision making. They can just, you know, make a quick telephone call or even just get on and do it without making a telephone call. Um, you know, it, 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 they are running their own company and, uh, and, uh, and that is more important than the salary they're getting. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's that freedom to be able to, um, uh, uh, to, I mean, I suppose, that, you know, the most satisfying thing I have is that, is, is, um, is that sense of freedom, and that's what, that's what success brings, brings you. As the owner and senior executive of the Virgin Group, Branson's a very busy man. But his working hours are not spent behind a desk. As a matter of fact, he doesn't have a desk. Instead, he's up and about, running from company to company, from presentation to press meeting, being of use wherever and however he can and most of all, serving as figurehead and spokesman for all of his various companies. As a company chairman, um, one's got, I suppose, three things. Um, you've got um, to spend your time uh, pushing your company into new areas, new businesses. Um, you've got to do a bit of firefighting when things are going wrong. Um, and you've got to promote your companies.
recipient will be Richard Ban Branson, who is chairman of Virgin Group. The uh, sort of environmental award by the, the, the surveyors for the best, you know, the best, best conversion in best conversion in England or something in this year. In England, <laughs> in England this year. The um, conservation. The conservation. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, Branson has to go and see a Virgin act every now and then, whenever they happen to be in town. We were about to sign to Virgin Records. Um, we hadn't agreed the deal yet. I mean, it was kind of like tender hooks, but Richard's very clever. Rather than just be deadly serious, you must sign with us, and this is the deal and things. He, he, he plays little games, and just before we're about to sign, we'd, we'd basically agree the deal, but not quite. There was a couple of little contract breakers. Um, I got this phone call to my office, and it was, uh, hello. I said, hi, hello. Yeah, this is Mo Austin from Warner Brothers, you know. Uh, I hear you might be signing to Virgin Records. I said, yeah, I was suspicious, you know. I said, yeah, well, we might be. I don't know yet. I haven't decided yet. You know, we're not sure. Well, uh, all I'm saying, don't sign to them. They're a bunch of bastards, you know. You can't sign to them. They're, you, you, you must sign to us. You know, and, I went, <laughs> and then it, it, the voice began to change a little bit. <laughs> and I went, Richard. <laughs> He's terrible. He was doing a, an amazing, a big deal, you know, at that time it was quite a big signing, you know. Yeah. And he, was still, he still had this uh, great sense of humour and this great uh, wind-up. I mean, that's the kind of thing that made us sign. And also there was one, uh, one major factor, I don't know if we ever told Richard, but at that time there was this big, big rumour in the industry that uh, Virgin were going down, they were going bankrupt. I don't know why they were starting that, whatever, but we just heard it. And every single record company said, there was five or six after us, and everyone said, if you don't go with us, don't go with Richard Branson. <laughs> and this was intriguing. Finally, I went over to a pub opposite my office, the whole band. And I said, right, who do you want to sign to? It's, it's virtually a toss-up between Polydor and Virgin. And uh, we talked about it for a little while. And they, they all kind of said, Virgin, 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 and asked me, Virgin. And they said, they said we don't know why, mind you. And I said, well, it's Richard, he's a devil. I mean, he's like a wizard, but you know, like there's black magic and white magic. Richard was like a, a white magician, and he was the white magic man. And so uh, he's, he's such a character, and a very uh, charismatic character. You know, and it does, he's tremendous for his company, although I don't think he knows anything about music. I remember things in my mind before we signed them, and, yeah, and, and, uh, uh, and I must admit, I didn't enjoy you on stage. <laughs> I mean, tonight, ten, tonight, ten years on or whatever, it's, it, it was just like a, it was just, it was great anyway. One of the Virgin traditions is the annual staff party, a two-day get-together for the employees of all the companies in Britain. A staff party as such is perhaps not so unusual, but Branson invites his staff, in typical Virgin style, to his own country house and garden. And of course, all his guests are encouraged to bring along partners and children. My principal, I think, rule in life is that is that people are what, all that matters in a company. Um, if you've got a, uh, a great bunch of people, you can achieve anything. Um, if they're highly motivated, enjoying what they do, um, they'll you know, work enormously hard and, and the company will be a success. Um, so I think the, the more time you can give to your people, the more successful the company's going to be. But it strikes a distant goal. So you look for 
I believe that, you know, a small is beautiful. Um, obviously, it's useful to have a powerful umbrella, you know, sort of the Virgin Group umbrella, which has got the financial strength. Um, but Virgin strength is lots of small units, uh, lots of small groups of people who know each other well. Um, and I think the, the danger with a lot of companies is they, they like to feel that they're the chairman of a big company and a big building, you know, with all these people working for them. I, I think they would do much better if they split, split, split their companies up into, um, say, 150 small companies and, and gave people stakes in the companies and, um, and said to them, you know, run this company as if it's your own company. Um, you, you know, give me a ring occasionally and tell me how it's getting on. Uh, give me a ring if you have a problem and maybe, you know, one of the other companies can help you out. I, I'm a, a personality in England because of my ballooning and boating trips. And there, I think that um, I can um, use that to uh, help on a, on a variety of things which I feel strongly about. Um, and also, obviously, we've got tremendous wealth now. Um, and I think that if you have, if you're a successful businessman, enormous wealth comes with it. If you're a successful doctor or nurse or journalist, or um, you're, you're no, no less successful, but wealth doesn't come with it. So I think a, a responsibility comes with being a successful businessman. Um, and uh, partly it might be using that wealth constructively, uh, whether it's investing in new ventures, uh, partly it might be helping charitable causes that you feel strongly about. The exciting thing about Virgin is you, you never quite know what's coming next. I mean, somebody you know, will walk through the door uh, with an idea in the morning, and the exciting thing is we can say, great, let's, you know, it's a wonderful idea, let's put it into you know, operation by the evening. Um, and so, so, you know, every, you know, almost every day is a new challenge. Looking for a new challenge, in 1984, Branson started his own airline, Virgin Atlantic Airways. Virgin Atlantic really took off. And nowadays, over a million passengers a year are flying Virgin to destinations worldwide, ranging from Los Angeles to Tokyo, Miami, and Moscow. Whenever there's a new route to celebrate, Branson makes it a rule to be on the inaugural flight, if possible with his wife and two children. arrived just sort of you know I, said, I, I didn't want people to see me so sort of glancing up at it but I, it was like a most fantastic toy uh, number one on we've flied to about seven major routes in, in the world at the moment and we're gonna we're gonna stop when we get to 12 so um, it's um, I mean by the time we're at 12 routes it'll be a billion pound company so it's it, it's it'll be I mean, the largest private company in Britain, but, but compared to other airlines, it'd be very small. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, we want to keep it small. Yeah. Start pressure, 40 PSI. Chicago doors. Lights out. We're celebrating a new route today. Um, so we've got a, quite a lot of journalists on board. Um, we've got a few uh, comedians, and uh, I think we'll have a fashion show as well, which be, is always quite good value. Um, we own a model agency, which is very nice, but uh, that's a, well, that I would love to have owned it about 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I can, now I can just look and not touch. Max motoring on three. Thank you.
Generally speaking, you know, you're dumped in a seat. You're served by somebody who obviously doesn't enjoy what they're doing. Uh, you're not entertained at all. The seats are uncomfortable, um, and it's like getting on a bus, just being shuffled from A to B. Um, and I felt that we could create an airline, um, which was good fun to fly on, uh, which was comfortable, which was run like a private club, um, where the staff enjoyed their job. Um, you know where because the staff were enjoying the job, the passengers you know, were enjoying travelling with the plane. And which worried about every single little detail, from the perfume in the loo, to, <laughs> uh, um, you know, to, uh, to, I don't know, ice creams or whatever. Wait, wait, wait. My sherry amore, lovely as the summer day. Steve, you want to meet me? Inside entertainment. Me. How many fingers am I holding up? Three. Oh, you can see this. Oh, I'm reading your mind. Remember? Reading my mind. Well done. Hello, I'm already down to you. All right. I've Branson also here. has a reputation for his pranks and practical jokes. So if there's a fashion show at 10,000 feet, it sometimes features none other than the chairman himself. Everything all right? has just completed its first flight between London and New York's JFK Airport. Richard Branson is with us this morning. Good morning. Hello, Faith. How are you? Most people would say that expanding an airline at this time, even for the most solid organization, would be pretty risky business. Why are you doing it? Well, we're not going to expand it too big. We, we plan to be uh, Britain's alternative long-haul airline, flying to the 12 major cities in the world. Um, we want to run our airline based on quality. We want to be the um, the best airline flying in the world, not the biggest. It always comes down to people in the air.
get as much publicity for his airline as he could, Branson embarked on a series of record-breaking attempts. First, he tried to win back the Blue Ribbon for Britain with the fastest boat crossing of the Atlantic. When his boat sank only a hundred miles off the coast of England, he just built another one and tried again. to win the Blue Ribbon back for Britain, uh, trying to be the fastest person across, or people across the Atlantic in a boat, um, uh, was a tremendous personal challenge, um, but it also got enormous worldwide publicity for the airline. Um, and it didn't cost us anything because, well, the first boat sank 100 miles before we got there and the insurance paid up. And uh, the second boat we, we managed to sell for the price of the project. Um, so. It was, a, a, a tr it was perhaps, I suppose, the, the perfect virgin project in that we enjoyed it enormously um, and, uh, and it was a good business as well. Um, and we then went one step further uh, on the balloon project, um, the crossing of the Atlantic and the balloon. This record attempt in 1986 again gave Branson and his airline massive publicity but it also nearly got him and his co-pilot killed. First, because one of the fuel tanks fell to the ground at liftoff and could easily have exploded. Later, because the balloon, the biggest one ever built, refused to descend. Strangely, we've uh, enjoying the worst fright of the trip, and we're finding great difficulty actually getting the balloon. The flight finally ended in the Irish Sea, with Branson escaping by the skin of his teeth. Although, understandably, he'd vowed never to do it again, in 1989, Branson and his co-pilot, Per Lindstrom, tried to take ballooning even further. This time they wanted to fly with a hot air balloon from Japan to the US across the Pacific. Since they were going to break their own long distance record, the balloon that had been designed for the occasion was bigger than any balloon ever before, including the one used on the transatlantic flight. It could, for example, easily have contained one of Branson's own jumbo jets or the Statue of Liberty. But the flight was cancelled at the last moment when one of the protective layers of the balloon started to peel off. The damage was manageable until large pieces of the material came off on the inside and clogged the balloon's burners. Had this happened after liftoff, it would have meant certain death for both men. Hopefully, next time, uh, we'll have better luck. 
Apart from his records, Branson is also widely known for the many charitable causes he's engaged in, like the UK 2000 campaign he supervised that was set up to help fight unemployment among young people in Britain. And the advisory centre, started in the old days of Student Magazine, also still exists. Hello, Health Advisory Centre. Um, Health is quite unique because it is a free service um, and it uh, has been and it continues to be totally sponsored by Richard. And to help fight AIDS, he launched the new and highly successful condom brand, Mates, of which all proceeds go to AIDS yeah. research. Have you got a pack of, um, a pack of, uh, a packet of tissues, please? Man-sized tissues. Is that all? Mates are a new range of condoms. Like other condoms, they're reliable, but they're cheaper. She sells hundreds of packets. She's not embarrassed. So why should you be? And a packet of Mates condoms, please. Of course. Mr. Williams, how much are these Mates condoms? Mates, you make love, they make sense. I think Virgin, as a company, should take a lead and should try to set examples on issues which, uh, you know, where, where there's an obvious need. And the exciting thing is, and, you know, as, as I've got older and, uh, you know, got to realise, is that um, a small pressure group can actually change things. When, you know, as a young kid, you believed that things could not be changed. It wasn't possible to change or influence things. Suddenly, I find myself in a position where, you know, perhaps some governments do listen and where, where I actually, you know, maybe can change things. I could well have been one of those sort of students who um, waffled around and um, didn't do things if I, um, because I wasn't interested in doing um, what was open to me. It's just that I was lucky enough at the age of 15 to become one trap minded and had an idea that I thought um, with an idea that might have worked. I mean, I never foresaw myself, um, you know, sitting in front of the television cameras or anything as a result of the idea. One thing led on to another, and uh, and one thing led on to another, mainly because we had to survive. It wasn't uh, it wasn't out of a grand any grand plan. Uh, having said that, now I am where I am. <laughs> um, I couldn't be happier to be where I am, where I am. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I often say to myself, if I'm not happy, uh, how could anybody be happy? I mean, I've, you know, I've got a, uh, a wonderful family, uh, lovely children, they're well and healthy. Um, I've got a, a fascinating career, um, completely varied, a uh, lovely bunch of people around me, working with me. Um, what more could I want? Favourite friends? It's a